Good afternoon to everybody, or good morning still to everybody hopping on with us. Thanks for joining us, and we will get started here in just about four minutes. We already have a Q&A there, Daniel, from a, a Mr. Pete Vergat. <laughs> Never heard of that guy. He says it's afternoon, but uh, you know, I understand that you it's afternoon. I, st I understand that most of American industry and politics runs on Eastern time, but we do not. <laughs> so we're now streaming live on Facebook. Thank you for everybody over there joining us. We're going to get started in just about three minutes now. Got an exciting show for you today. For the folks who are already with us on uh, on Zoom, you want to tell us where you're joining us from? Yeah, it'd be in interesting to hear where everybody is from. This is gardening in the Panhandle. We got anyone from outside the Panhandle of Florida listening? Yeah, and if even if you're in the Panhandle, just shout out what city, your town, yeah. county that you're in. Be glad to know you're joining us. They can practice using their chat bar. That's right. Someone has a hand up, Aline. No, Aline, if you want to type a question or can, they, can we hear them? Can they unmute themselves and ask a question on this version, Daniel? Oh, I don't know. If you have a question, please type it in the chat for us. We'll be super happy to answer it. And again, if you're just joining us, um, please type oh, okay. in the chat where you're from. Chat is disabled. So you may have to go to Q&A, folks. There you go. OK. All right, we got Tampa. Tampa. Family over there in Bay County. Pensacola. Now, do you say it fountain or is it fountain? Fountain. Fountain, okay. I wasn't sure. Oh, Micanope down I there learned, south of Gainesville. Omega, Georgia is Omega. Anyway. Yeah. So, so far, the farthest is Tampa, and second is Micanopy. Very cool. Crawfordville, Milton, Santa Rosa County, Okaloosa County. Welcome, everyone. Yeah, it's awesome. Pat Williams in Crawfordville. That sounds familiar, don't it? <laughs> yeah. I think we know that guy. So, the chat has been re-enabled. Any of you guys can post your questions over there. It'll be a little easier. Osceola. All right. That might be that might beat Tampa. It's gonna be close, yeah. I don't know. So about about one more minute, folks. We'll get started. Wait for the last few people that are gonna join us to hop on. Pace. I've I used to live just north of Pace in Shemukla, Sherry. Very familiar. <laughs> All right, well, it's 12 o'clock. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome to Gardening in the Panhandle Live. Um, we're an interactive webinar series produced by the University of Florida IFAS, Northwest District Horticulture Team. Um, this is our first session for 2021. And of course, it's focusing on weeds in the chat. In a minute, you should be able to find a flyer with our calendar for the rest of the year. Hopefully you've seen that before, but if not, you'll see it today. So you know what's coming up every uh, once a month. We're going to be providing you with a, a chance to have all your gardening questions answered and today of course will be weeds we're going to have a wonderful panel for you comprised of extension agents specialists and other special guests and on that note today i'd like to go ahead and introduce our panelists we'll start uh, with our extension specialist today dr chris marvel hey chris tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started 
Thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm Chris Marble. I'm assistant professor at uh, University of Florida. I'm uh, stationed in Apopka, so um, in, I'm at the Mid Florida Research and Education Center. Um, originally from uh, uh, Northeast Alabama, actually, but my focus area is um, on weed management and ornamental plants and landscapes and in nurseries. So Chris's job is literally to kill the weeds that you guys are asking about and figure out how to do it better. So we thank you for joining us and we'll move on down the line. Beth, good morning or good afternoon now. Good afternoon. Yeah, glad to be here. I'm Beth, a horticulture agent in Scambia County and so happy to be with this great panel today, starting out. Yeah, first one of 2021. Mark Tansey, good, good afternoon. Yes, yeah, way into the afternoon here. I'm on Eastern time zone. Hi there, folks. Mark Tanzig. I'm the horticulture agent in Leon County in Tallahassee. And again, happy to be here. Uh, talk about weeds. And last but certainly not least, in the coldest spot in the panhandle, live <laughs> in the frozen tundra, Larry Williams. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And I'm Larry Williams. I'm the horticulture agent in Okaloosa County. I live in Crestview, and that is correct. It is cold <laughs> in Crestview. <laughs> yep. Uh, and we've got several wonderful folks behind the scenes. We have Mary Salinas from Santa Rosa County. Julie McConnell is our producer from, from Bay County. And we also have Matt Lawler, uh, also in Santa Rosa County. So thanks to everybody that participates in this that makes it possible. And we hope that you enjoy what we've gotten for you today. And of course, my name is Daniel Leonard. I will be your host today and a couple of other times this year. I'm the County Extension Director and Horticulture Agent in Calhoun County. So let's go ahead and dive into the fun part, our questions. We're going to start off today um, with just kind of figuring out what weeds are. We had several questions about this. And our first one, we're going we're gonna to stick with Mark Tansic here, rapid fire three questions. Mark, we have a question from a Zoom, uh, Zoom listener. Weeds seem to be a pejorative term, but what, so what's good about them? Well, the important thing to remember about weeds is that it's all your opinion, right? So there is no definition of, you know, exactly what plant is a weed or not. So I'm thinking another one of the questions is, you know, is there a list of weeds for Florida? And there was another question, you know, how do I know the plant in my yard is a weed or not? And it's all up to you. So the, the definition of a weed is a plant out of place. So, you know, invasive plants, definitely weeds out of place. We, we consider those officially weeds, but everything else, it's, you know, a rose could be a weed if it's growing out of your, a crack of your sidewalk. So um, there is no <clears throat> strict definition as to what plants are weeds and what plants are not. It's all if, do you want it there or not? So. <clears throat> I think that's I think that's what I got. Now, Dr. Marvel here, he's a PhD in weed science. I don't know if you want to add something to that, Dr. Marvel. That's exactly what I would say, Mark. Uh, uh, another definition, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, is a plant for which its virtues have not yet been discovered. So okay. uh, that's, a, that's another uh, definition that I'll share with people. Um, but yeah, so essentially it's all subjective. It's, it's basically a plant that's out of place. Um, it could be anything. Um, uh, oak seedlings, for example, uh, uh, those are common weeds and turf grass, uh, where, you know, you might want, you're going to want oak trees, you know, in other places. So, Awesome. Well, so y'all know it's going to be a, a good year because we're already, we're five minutes in and we're getting classic American literature dropped on us. So yeah. <laughs> I want to follow up real quick because she asked, what are they good for? Or the, the listener asked, what are they good for? And some are edible. <clears throat> and a lot of these, what we would, a lot of folks call weeds, some of those might be native plants that actually do provide, you know, pollination services or, you know, some type of value to wildlife. So uh, again, it's all what humans think of that plant. I, I like that Ralph Waldo Emerson quote. I got to look that up. Yeah, that's good. All right, Mark. So that's good. That's all well and good, but we want to know if kind of officially, you know, what, what the majority of folks in Florida think is a weed. And so is there a place that we can go to find a weed list for Florida? Well, I think what we're going to put in the chat here is there is a great book uh, that's available from the IFAS bookstore, and it's the Weeds of Southern uh, Lawn Grass, or Weeds of Southern Turf Grass, I believe. Oh, there it is. Dr. Marvel's got it right there. That one is great. It's a picture book. Uh, give tells you all the information that you're going to need to know. <laughs> Look, we all have it right next to our desk. Look at that. Use it uh, all the time. Uh, you know, it's going to have a lot of important information. And when we get further along in this discussion about pre-emergence and post-emergence, 
there's some key information in that book for each of those weeds. It's going to tell you some clues as to, you know, which herbicides are going to be helpful in trying to combat that weed. Awesome. So that's really good. We've kind of got a little bit of a taste for, you know, what is a weed, a couple of different definitions there and, and a good, a really good resource, you know, Chris and Mark just mentioned this weeds for Southern turf grasses. If you don't have a copy, I highly recommend that you, that you purchase yourself one. It's well worth it. I, we all use it all the time. I mean, all of us here could probably grab one with relative ease. So with that, we're going to start into some weed control methods. And we're first going to begin on uh, non-chemical weed control methods. And I'm sure our panelists are going to mention this, but this is generally where we recommend folks start. Before you reach for the chemicals, think about some other things first. And so Chris, we'll get started. Um, our first question in this section from a Zoom listener is how to safely get rid of weeds in flower beds also. So uh, I guess if you're talking about safety in terms of avoiding injury to other landscape plants, and you might also be referring to safety in terms of protecting yourself if you were worried about using uh, pesticides and things like that. But there's a lot of non-chemical things that uh, you can do in landscape beds. So mulch is going to be the number one uh, most effective thing. Um, uh, we have research showing one application of mulch, if it's applied at least two inches thick, that's going to be more effective than one application of any pre-emergence herbicide that you go out and buy. So uh, uh, one application of mulch, uh, if it's done properly, uh, that's going to provide you weed control for months for a lot of species. Uh, now for some things like, for example, um, nut sedge, uh, you could go out there with six inches of asphalt and nut sedge will find a way to, uh, to come up through that. But for, for most weed species, mulch is going to be very effective. Uh, of course, there's, there's hand weeding, hoeing, uh, things like that. So just uh, uh, cultural controls. Um, flame weeding is also another one that people often don't think about. Uh, personally, that's my favorite method of non-chemical <laughs> control. Um, it is very fun to go out. And if you're, you're talking about, um, you know, getting some um, uh, uh, re relief and relieving stress, um, nothing like blow torching some, some <laughs> weeds uh, in the driveway or the, uh, the garden. You have to be safe and everything, of course. Uh, safety first, but uh, there are there are um, uh, little um, things that are designed for that little uh, uh, basically flame weeders uh, that are designed for, for weed control. So uh, that's another one. Awesome. So you touched on mulch there a second ago. Before we get this question, uh, I see that we've got a listener on Facebook from Tennessee. So that's they are the official winner of the farthest away listener. So hello uh, to y'all in Tennessee on Facebook. But Chris, you mentioned mulch. So uh, do you have a, uh, an idea of what mulch might work best or, or what tends to be most available that works best? So we, we've done a lot of work looking at a bunch of different mulches and um, uh, in general, I like, I mean, I like the organic mulches uh, the best just because they provide a lot of benefits in, in addition to uh, weed control. So that'll be things like pine bark, pine straw, um, uh, wood chips, et cetera, et cetera. So all those can be effective. What you want to look for in a mulch is you want something uh, that's going to have, uh, when you're looking at specifically for weed control, so something that has a relatively larger particle size. So like uh, think of a pine bark mini nugget. So that's like a, a really good size for, for weed management. Um, when you get into some of the wood materials, those can be very effective and they are good, but uh, they are going to, um, the smaller particle mulches that are like the shredded woods, they're gonna hold more moisture. And so weeds will be able to germinate in those better than they could say a pine bark nugget or a pine straw. Um, another thing to think of is when you're choosing a mulch is the durability of it. Uh, pine bark is generally going to last longer than straw. It's basically going to go pine bark is the longest, uh, then your wood chips, and then your, your straw um, in terms of uh, durability there. Uh, of course, rock and things like that uh, are going to last the longest, but then um, you run into a lot of other costs and things like that when you're, when you're utilizing those types of um, mulch materials. But all of them can be effective. The depth is, is typically the most important thing. You want it to be about two to three uh, inches or so, and make sure you don't pile it up, you know, around the plants and things like that. Gotcha. And I get questions from time to time with folks wanting to know if they can use like fallen oak leaves and things like that as mulch. Is that, is that appropriate? Just things you rake up? Sure. Yeah. You can use, um, uh, you can use uh, leaves are good. Uh, I mean, people will use um, grass clippings and they can be good for plants, but you want to be careful with that. Um, 
Uh, if you have a lot of weeds that you're, you're mowing, those grass clippings are going to have those, those seeds in there. Um, you can also run into some issues. It's really not that big of a, a deal most cases, but uh, you can run into some issues with some of the turf herbicides being on grass clippings. So that could be a concern in, in some cases, like with um, vegetable plants and stuff like that. But yeah, the, the grass clippings and stuff can work and leaves are good, um, but uh, they don't last very long. So that's the downside to that. Awesome. That was pretty good explanation on uh, how to use mulch and how to control weeds without using chemicals. I appreciate it, Chris. Beth, got a couple, many, many listeners ask a question along these lines. Uh, does mowing or inline trimming weeds promote root growth and spreading, making uh, pulling weeds a better method? Um, also talking about like running weeds and things like that is what, what, how should we minimize these types of weeds? Yeah, we're always looking for ways to control some of these weeds and a weed trimmer or some way to mechanically knock them down would be great. And that's going to work for certain weeds that really respond to mowing. Um, when we talk about turf in general, we talk about, you know, mowing at the right height and to kind of shade out those weeds. But a lot of times we have weeds that may grow up and some of those do respond well to mowing, especially ones that are going to be bigger weeds like ragweed, senna, Johnson grass, uh, and they will go laterally. And think about it, you just stress that weed with mowing. And so there's going to be less food reserves to, to shove into really developing a really good root system. So cutting off those weeds is not necessarily going to promote a root development on those plants. Although on a lot of weeds, it will cause some lateral growth. And a good example is like chamber bitter. You can cut it off and it's going to send out nice lateral stems to the side and those will seed as well. So not all weeds are controlled well through that kind of repeated trimming. Some adjust, some are low growing like crabgrass and spurge. And so it really won't have an effect on those. But your taller growing weeds, horseweed, sennas, uh, like your little candlestick weed, those will respond well to the trimming if you want to knock them down. Another thing too, if you have kind of a serious weed issue in the grass, you know, keeping those mowed off so they don't go to seed will help uh, reduce that seed bank that you have going back into the soil. So good consistent mowing and even knocking some down with a weed trimmer will help for sure. Now running weeds, not as much. Remember grass is a, a running plant too, and you cut that off repeatedly and it wants to spread. So you're gonna have to kind of dig out those running weeds a little bit more than you would just knocking them back. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I, some of us, you know, wear multiple hats in extension and we talk with cattle producers and pasture pasture folks. And that's one of the first things, you know, that rules of pasture weed management is to is to mow and graze and, you know, keep those things from going to seed. So that makes sense for some, but not all, right? Awesome. So Mark, we've talked about some ways to minimize weeds through mulch, uh, mowing and different things, but I think you've got some other sort of integrated pest management principles you want to mention to us on how to minimize weeds. Just lots of questions. Uh, pertaining to this? Yeah, so the the main thing, and this is especially true for lawns, right, is you want your lawn to be as healthy as possible to outcompete those weeds, right? So one way to minimize the number of weeds in your lawn is just to have a really healthy lawn. So uh, I think the link I provided for this particular question, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff that goes into that healthy lawn. I kind of just threw in the FYN handbook, so the Florida Friendly um, uh, the Florida Friendly Group out of IFAS puts together this Florida Yards and Neighborhoods Handbook with these nine principles. And there's several principles that kind of go to ensuring healthy plants, uh, healthy lawns, right? So we want to select the right kind of turf grass. We want to water it properly, irrigate it properly, mow it properly. Uh, and in our garden beds, we want to make sure the plants are really healthy and also use mulch, like Dr. Marvel said, to try to minimize the weeds as much as possible. That's going to be the best thing we can do. We don't want to introduce, you know, those discount racks at the hardware store, at the garden center that, you know, everything's 50, 80% off. There's weeds falling all over the side of the pots. You know, we want to not buy those and put them in our garden because we're bringing those weeds in. So prevention, keeping your turf happy, your plants healthy, that's going to be one of the ways that you're going to just stop weeds before they become a problem, hopefully. 
Very good. Yeah. So there's lots of different methods to weed control there. Um, Beth, a final method, and this is going to be more for like vegetable gardens and landscaping beds and things like that. Uh, we had a couple of folks asking, what's the best material for smothering weeds in a large area? So like newspaper, cardboard, what would your recommendation be if you wanted to try to smother weeds in an area? Now, I may be a little controversial on this. Um, you know, there's a great techniques out there that people have been using to use kind of newspaper or cardboard in areas. Um, but my recommendation would be to use those more in walkway areas than around where plants are growing. Uh, there's a researcher out in Washington State who's written some really good material. And she said cardboard and uh, newspaper can control weeds um, a little bit better than fabric but that's not really much of a compliment. Um, so we, it's not really, we kind of think that's really doing a, a benefit and it may help us a little bit, but what actually happens with those materials is that is gonna make roots grow a little bit closer to the surface, bring up a lot of these soil microbes to the surface in search of oxygen. We know how important oxygen is in that soil system. And sometimes if you have too much of a layer, it's gonna interfere with that oxygen flow. So if you wanna use these materials that are gonna decompose in a walkway, kind of in rows where you're not really have roots growing in, that would be fine. But we really wanna stay away from some of those materials right where plant roots are gonna be. Think about the droughts that we go through as well. Uh, water may, may not penetrate through those quite as well. And then it, the water's gonna run off when you do irrigate. So not the best situation with the fabrics and the cardboards and things around active plant roots. Uh, and there's a good article about the fabric. So be kind of cautious with that. Now, Dr. Marble, I don't know if you've done some work with the fabric or seen anything different. Um, with that, if you can, you may throw in some of your experience. Sure, yeah, so uh, with the fabric specifically, um, uh, we've done a little bit of stuff and then there's also some work out of Virginia Tech and some other places. So since you with the fabric, what you're doing is you have a, a benefit, but for a very short period of time. And it's just like um, uh, Beth is talking about. So uh, it creates a couple of issues. Uh, the main thing is one, um, nut sedge and a lot of these perennial weeds are going to be able to come up through that uh, regardless. Uh, and then two, eventually your mulch and all the organic debris that's blown on top of that fabric is going to eventually create a good environment for those weeds to grow. They're going to be on the top part of the, the surface, just like she said. And then when you go in to actually pull those, what's going to happen? You're going to pull that fabric up uh, and uh, uh, along with the mulch and everything, and it just creates, uh, you know, a bigger mess uh, than you had to begin with. And it can also be very difficult to install those around existing plants where it creates any sort of um, benefit. So, uh, I mean, in my experience and uh, talking to people and then the, the work that's been done in other places, um, generally, I would say, you know, you're going to be better off with, with uh, the mulch um, uh, alone and not even going through the cost and the trouble of, of using the fabrics. I swear by everything he just says. I've experienced with all those nutgrass popping through it. it yeah. Being a mess. Yeah. And goodness gracious, I've purchased a house before uh, where the previous owner had installed a landscape and put down the landscape fabric everywhere. I wanted to redo the landscape. My goodness, trying to redo that where that fabric had been put down is just a nightmare. So that's yeah. a Daniel, I, I think there's personal preference in that too. Uh, I don't care for the landscape fabrics. One of the reasons I don't is because I like to get in the plant beds, even, even landscape beds, flower beds. As a horticulturist, I think all of us, uh, you change things, you want to replant things, plants die. It's difficult to do that sort of thing and difficult to get in. I, I'll do some mechanical weeding with a hoe or pulling weeds, raking. Good luck doing that when you have yeah, the sure. fabric down. Yeah. All right. Uh, so now we're going to move on from cultural weed control into um, into chemical weed control here. Uh, and Chris, we'll get started with you. Lots of folks wanted to know a version of this question, and it's, I have weeds more or less year-round in the lawn. How do I know when to use a pre-emergent herbicide? So basically, when to use and how often should we be using this? So there's a couple of different schools of thought on this. Um, uh, essentially, the most, the probably, uh, if you have St. Augustine or like a lot of these warm season grasses, probably your, your most important application is going to be that springtime application. 
um, when the temperature uh, is, you know, somewhere between 55, 70 degrees. Uh, we have a couple of guides and then there's a, uh, there we go, we just posted the uh, weed control for Florida lawns and that gives a um, uh, temperature range for that. Uh, and really the main thing with the uh, with that application, that first application is you're giving yourself a good head start on those warm season uh, annual weeds. Crabgrass and our annual grasses being um, uh, really public enemy number one there because we don't have post-emergence herbicide options for those. And so that's, a, that's, a, that's an important um, application is your first springtime application. Um, and then I would say it kind of depends upon the other wheat species that are problematic. So if you have some of these later germinating species, like say you had dove weed every year, for instance, and um, dove weed is going to be pretty consistent in terms of when it comes up. It's going to come up around May or so, um, uh, you know, uh, about that time frame. So that by the time you get to that dove weed season, your crabgrass application that you applied February, Marches, it's not going to be uh, really remaining. And so you could go back with another application, uh, you know, in late April uh, around that time frame and give yourself a head start on some of those summer, uh, summer annual weeds that are, that are uh, going to germinate later in the season. Um, that's going to give you control of things like uh, dove weed, chamber bitter, um, several other of these species that are going to be germinating later on in the summer. Also, during the hottest part of the summer, we're going to be limited with the post-emergence herbicides that we can use. So that would be a benefit there. Um, you could do another, you know, application in the fall uh, if you wanted to, but that's uh, it really just depend upon the situation. Um, but really, uh, I mean, a lot of people have success with one or two applications per year um, uh, and then just spot spraying post-emergence herbicides if it's needed. But if you do those things like Mark was talking about specifically with taking care of the turf grass, you're probably not going to need, you know, too many pre-emergence herbicide applications. Okay, that's, that's good to know. And so uh, kind of along these lines for homeowners, what is sort of the best pre-emergent to use? I understand we have several different situations. You know, we have turf grass, and then we kind of have landscape beds. So could you kind of give us a couple of options for each of those situations? Yeah, so there's a couple different active ingredients that are going to be widely available that are going to give you fairly broad spectrum weed control, or at least control a lot of your grassy weeds. And I'm just going to list. So we have a lot of publications that we're going to be posting in the chat box. I saw in um, our list that we had gathered up, we have a lot of good um uh, different resources with a lot of the different um, trade names. Um, and so I'm just going to list some of the active ingredients because those are the only ones that that's the only thing I'm familiar with and the trade names change so frequently uh, anyways. But um, so some general ones would be things like pendimethalin, um, uh, isoxibin, uh, that's like something for uh, some of your more broadleaf weeds. Um, uh, trying to think of some other, prodiamine, dithiopure, um, options like that, they're going to be, uh, you can use those and there's labels for those where they can be used in turf grass uh, or in landscape beds. But I, like when someone asks what's the best herbicide, I always say, what's the weed species that you're targeting and what's the situation? Um, because no one herbicide is going to be effective in every situation or even for every weed. Every herbicide has holes in it in terms of weeds that it's not going to control. And so I tell people to think of herbicides as tools. So uh, you're not going to pick a hammer when you need a screwdriver. And so you've got to know what it, the job is that you want to accomplish and then pick the best herbicide for that. And a lot of these resources that we'll be uh, posting here uh, will kind of guide you in that. Uh, and because you want to be really species specific and pick the best option for your specific scenario. Uh, yeah, I, you hear all the time, you know, they ask you, what's the best one to use? And I'm like, well, it depends, right? <laughs> so I think Chris, a good job there of, of kind of laying out the, the meat behind the it depends answer. So it depends. I say that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know our listeners love that because that's I know. my favorite thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Beth, getting into kind of a specific weed here that we can target with pre-emergence. So what's the best way to remove a large area of coastal sand burrs in a yard? We had one specific Zoom listener ask this question. Well, this is one of the weeds that often comes into our office late in the season when it's in seed because those seeds are so painful to deal with. Animals are out. Kids can't enjoy the area. You know, I have experience with sand burr uh, down on the Navy base riding my bike years ago and end up with a flat tire. Uh, you know, and people have gotten them 
caught in their Crocs and sandals and they're no fun to deal with. But the good thing about sand burr is it, it's a grass and we have really good uh, pre-emergent herbicides that can manage grasses. But the question is sand burr loves our climate. It loves dry, poor, sandy soil, those sunny areas. If all you have is sand burr, it's not really going to benefit you coming in and using something selective possibly. Uh, so you may, if you're, if you're planning and really want to have a turf in that area, you may think of, and you want to invest the time in turf. Remember it's, it's work. Uh, you may want to kill out that whole area. Uh, you'll still have some seeds underground, but then reestablish that after a broad spectrum uh, herbicide is put down, you know, that's safe, that you can replant afterwards, mm -hmm. kill that off when, during the growing season, then resod or, or put turf down. And then the next cycle that comes around in, in spring, like Dr. Marble was talking about, you can use a pre-emergent once that turf is established, uh, it's, it's ready to go, can handle that herbicide and very, very lightly watered in, you know, don't overdo when it, you put your pre-emergent out. That's one of the failure issues is people put down too much water after they put that pre-emergent. But you can kind of get on that cycle to start reducing that sand burr in that situation. Um, but realize if you don't have a replacement uh, spot, a plant and you're killing off that sand burr, it's just going to come right back with some other weed. So you kind of have to decide what you want to do with that area. Gotcha. That's awesome. Yeah. So Chris, while we're kind of on that, uh, on that subject, what is a, a, you know, Beth mentioned this a second ago, what's kind of a threshold for how bad does a weed problem have to be before you consider, you know, starting over or something like that, as opposed to trying to selectively knock all those various weeds out? Uh, yeah, it would just depend upon the, uh, the, the time, your time frame and how fast you wanted um, that area kind of corrected. Yeah. Um, I mean, once, I mean, you know, even, even something where they have like 50% coverage in weeds, uh, you can get that back under control. It's just going to take time. Gotcha. Um, uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, and you wouldn't have to go back in and do a complete, you know, kill all and, and reside. So it would just depend upon uh, the amount of time that someone wants to invest. And then if someone wanted, you know, immediate results, then um, yeah, it's going to take a long time because with all these weed species, you kill the ones that are already there, but then you also have the, the, um, the, the, the seed bank that's in the soil that you're going to have to deal with for, uh, you know, a period of time until you get that, that grass, uh, your desired turf. Uh, reestablished, but the main thing is going to be to, to um, help that turf grass to grow and to be healthy, and that's going to help you with the weeds better than anything. And I always tell people I think of weeds as secondary invaders. They're often going to come in because something else isn't right, and they can be more of a, a symptom of a bigger problem. Um, poor soils, irrigation, fertilization, mowing, um, uh, you know, issues, things like that. So think of those as secondary invaders and take care of the root problem, which is probably going to be the turf grass health or, you know, mulch level, things like that. Gotcha. So we're going to go ahead and move. Those are some awesome discussions on pre-emergent herbicide use. Now we're going to go to what everybody's favorite, you know, we've seen the problem talking about some post-emergent herbicide use. And so we're going to switch back to Beth here, you know, Larry and Mark, y'all get ready because you're coming up here in a second. We're not going to let you rest too long. All right. So Beth, uh, lots of folks ask this question. These are two very very common lawn species that we have, but this is specifically a client in Pensacola. What's the best, you know, we talked about this again, what's the best, what's the best broad spectrum weed herbicide from Pensacola for St. Augustine and centipede lawn grass? So remember, homeowners are gonna have some options and our commercial applicators are gonna have more options. Um, so they will have a few more uh, uh, options in their, their toolkit in order to help control some of these weeds, especially some broadleaf weeds in Centipede and St. Augustine. But in general, for a homeowner, if you're kind of doing something and uh, you've, you're doing everything else right with turf, you're watering, you're mowing, uh, all that kind of care, but you still have a few weeds pop up, um, you've missed, you've done some of the pre-emergence we've talked about, and you have some that have emerged. There are a couple of options that you can get. Um, one of the examples would be um, weed-free zone. It's a combination of chemicals that you can use. Uh, there are always some precautions with that product, um, precautions on applying it during spring green up. You want to stay away from that. Precautions on applying it when you're above 90 degrees. 
So remember, if you're controlling some of these post-emergent weeds that are already up, you're still controlling them when they're small. When they get really big, they're not going to be, that chemical's not going to work as well. It's not going to move as well in that plant. There's too much plant material there. So control them when they're small, kind of in that May time frame uh, before we hit that 90 degrees. Uh, if you want to use also something, the weed stop is pretty good. That's also a mix of products. And a lot of the weed stop also has a pre-emergent in it. So some of those late emerging, it may not be great, but some of that dove weed and chamber bitter may be knocked back because some of them, the one I've used in the past has had some of that esoxabin in it as the pre-emergent, which is, you know, pretty good with chamber bitter. It's not bad for a homeowner product. And so you'll get the, the action. Now, one thing to remember, especially with St. Augustine, these products that contain 2,4-D, you are going to get some yellowing for a few weeks on that St. Augustine. That's going to be typical. So make sure your grass is, is fairly healthy to begin with, and it will recover from that yellowing. And it's going to be slow acting. Uh, with a lot of these products, uh, there are a few that kind of knock them back quicker, but don't expect something overnight. Remember, the plant has to take it up, move it to growing points, and that takes time. Um, so don't think of it like an insect killer where you spray a can and it's dead the next day. That doesn't always happen with, with some of our weed control products. But those are two to think about um, before we get too warm and uh, after that spring green up phase to control some post-emergence. Awesome. And Chris mentioned this earlier, Beth, you know, we love St. Augustine, but if it has one weakness, as far as weed control goes, what would that be? It is not very tolerant of, of a lot of herbicides. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so it's going to have some issues, but always read that label because there, those precautions will be on there and you want to use the right rates and so on. No, it's not exciting reading, but it's there for <laughs> a reason. Uh, we don't want to get your call, uh, you know, trying to figure out how to help you recover a lawn. Um, we would rather help you prevent these things and kind of use them correctly uh, with sure. everything that you can do. That's a great point. We're a lot better at helping you prevent things than recover those problems after they're really bad. And so Mark, you know, wake up over there in Tallahassee. We've got a question for you from a Zoom listener. You know, we all have dogs, cats, whatever it may be, and we also have weeds in the lawn. So what are some pet friendly lawn weed control options? Are there any? So that is a really good question. And I'm glad Beth brought up. So I don't mind sitting here not answering question because I get to learn a lot from Dr. Marvel and Beth and, and all y'all folks here. So it's been great. But the she mentioned reading the label. So it's always very important to read the label of your pesticide products. Uh, what you will find is that for, uh, you know, keeping pets and children and, you know, wildlife in general safe, but if you guys want to focus on your pets, you know, there's some general guidelines and it's, uh, there's something that popped up here in the Zoom chat here. It's the, from the National Pesticide Information Center, I believe, which is a really great resource for folks wanting to learn more about just pesticides and herbicides in general. But they provide you with a list of some really good things to think about if you have pets that are out in the lawn. So things like, you know, removing the uh, dog toys or whatever from the area, you know, making sure they're not out there before or while the stuff, is, while the product is still wet, you know, the main thing is, is once you apply this material, especially if it's a liquid product, you want to wait till it dries before anyone gets back on that lawn. And that's going to be right in the label. It's going to tell you that as well. If you're using something like a, a granular product that needs to be watered in, uh, again, you'd probably want to wait um, as to when it dries, right? So uh, that link's got some other kind of tips on, you know, what to kind of consider for your pets. But the main thing is when you apply it, wait till it dries before your dogs, your kids, whoever gets back on there. Solid point for any and all pesticide use there. Awesome. Very good. Um, so we'll go to Larry here. Larry, we've got a Zoom question, um, just the generic one. So it's got a couple parts. The first part is generic and it gets specific. What's the best time to put out weed killer? Also, if I'm using Fertilone, which is a, a product, the one that she's talking about, a 2,4-D based product, um, can I spray now? Do I need to use another weed killer? So just kind of give us some general pointers on that, if you will. Okay, thank you. Um, I have to share something I read years ago in a, a weed control 
publication. It might have been in a book. Let's hear it. It stated weeds do not produce unhealthy lawns. Unhealthy lawns produce weeds. Yes. And I think that's <clears throat> people need to keep that in mind. Sometimes we're we're causing our own problems. And I, you know, I tell people to I, I don't like to use terms that maybe apply to people and apply those to plants, but I think this helps get the message across. The weeds begin to, you need to ask the question, why is this lawn unhealthy? It could be that you're mowing it too low. It could be that you're trying to grow grass in an inappropriate area where uh, there's too many trees, not just shade, but the competition from the tree roots. Uh, sometimes you just simply have an area that is not appropriate to grow lawn grass and you need to step back and, and ask a question, what else would work here? So moving on from that, timing is absolutely critical. Uh, you, you look at the, the, how, how prolific these weeds are in producing seeds. And one example, a crabgrass, for example, can produce one crabgrass plant left to grow through its entire life cycle, which is it's a summer annual, basically, mm -hmm. uh, can pr produce over 50,000 weeds. Not so <laughs> you're always ahead of the game by controlling weeds before they reproduce themselves. That might be through a pre-emergent product. And, and uh, Chris mentioned earlier that how critical that is. You have a calendar approach. And then you have to fine tune that. You look at what the temperature range is to make sure you're applying it at exactly the right time. And most of these pre-emergent products will state on the label to apply a second application six to eight or six to nine weeks after the initial application to achieve season long control. So it's just not, you know, we control is not simple, but timing is so critical and life happens here in Florida. Yeah, for sure. We get in the rainy season and uh, I was doing a great job in my vegetable garden and all of a sudden it's just rain, rain, rain. And I work, yep. I've, I've got two kids and you know, everything that goes with that. And they get ahead of you. And once that happens, um, the, so you have some crabgrass coming up in the vegetable garden, each plant can produce 50,000 seeds. You, you, you understand what, you know, it's, you get behind it's quick. Potential. So timing is so important. And the final thing I'd like to say on this, when you do use a pre-emergent product, whether it's granular or uh, liquid, most of those products that I'm familiar with when applied correctly, they create a chemical barrier along the soil surface that's temporary. Right. So you apply the liquid according to the label directions or the granular products. So along that soil surface, you're creating a chemical barrier. The, the seeds still germinate and attempt to push up through that. But when they attempt to push up through it is when the, the seedlings are killed. So if you see them already up and growing, you're too late for most pre-emergence. Right. There's an exception, an old product called atrazine has both pre-emergent and post-emergent properties, but most herbicides are either one or the other. Yeah. Awesome. Good answer. Thank you, Larry. Uh, got a question for Chris. Chris is probably the most controversial question in all of herbicides right now. So we're talking about glyphosate, which of course the active ingredient in the product Roundup. And we have lots of folks that want recommendations for broad spectrum herbicides that are safer than glyphosate. Could you tell us, shed a little light on the glyphosate subject with this question? Okay, the, that's a loaded question. And for me to talk on glyphosate, I could take Very. the rest of the, um, the afternoon. So yeah. I'm not gonna get into the, uh, the controversy of glyphosate and everything, but I don't like um, when people think of one herbicide or one pesticide being safer than the other. I try to tell people not to think of it as being safer or less safe. Okay, yeah, a lot of them are more acutely, uh, can be more acutely toxic uh, to people, but any pesticide can be uh, safe or not safe. Even our, some of our organic uh, products can be uh, very uh, dangerous uh, when we use those. You have to use everything according to the label directions, and if they're not used according to the label, and you're not wearing the PPE that it says, you're not wearing the eye protection, the gloves, et cetera, anything that you're applying can be uh, not safe. So I'll say that uh, at the first, just because I don't like to say any pesticide is safe. Um, uh, two, if you're looking for just uh, alternatives to glyphosate, the first thing I'll say is don't just go and pick up a herbicide and use it because it's not glyphosate. 
I've seen this uh, a couple of cases where someone would choose a horrible option, uh, uh, something that is more acutely uh, toxic to them uh, because it wasn't uh, glyphosate. So that's nothing that I would say. Um, two, if you want a broad spectrum herbicide that's an alternative to glyphosate, I came out with a um, uh, either document uh, fairly recently that lists a bunch of different options. So if you're somebody that doesn't want to use glyphosate, which is understandable, or you don't want to use any synthetic pesticide, which a lot of people don't, um, I have a lot of options in there that are OMRI certified, meaning that they're organically certified. So there's organic herbicides in there. Uh, there's also some other broad spectrum non-selective um, herbicides in there that can be used in the same manner uh, that glyphosate does where you apply it basically at a constant uh, at a solution uh, and then you spot treat uh, weeds with it so a bunch of different options in there um, uh, that people can go and get uh, there a lot of them are widely available so that would be if you look you know i know in florida recently a lot of you know townships cities counties things have banned the use of glyphosate those would kind of be your options you know if you live there correct yeah so they uh yeah probably the, and on the uh, as far as the um uh, the professionals, the main alternative that everyone is using is a product called Finale, which is glufosinate. Right. Um, uh, it actually has a warning label uh, on it. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, anyways, so you have to have a certain license to be able to use that. They can't use the things um, with, uh, out. they have to use only products with a caution label, but right. yeah, that's the number one um, alternative that people are using. But yeah, in landscapes, there's a bunch of different uh, things that homeowners could go and get. So I like the answer to, you know, not think of herbicides necessarily as safe or safer. It's kind of, you know, how you use them and, and that's right. Do you follow the label? <laughs> so, awesome. Couldn't have, could not have done that better. Very good, Chris. I appreciate it. Uh, Beth, after that question, the next most popular question today deals with our old friend, the dollar weed. Is there a way to permanently get rid of dollar weeds without killing your yard? Can you do it safely? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> we love dollar weed, right? Oh, yeah. Now, you probably will learn through this today that Mark and I are pretty tolerant of a lot of things, uh, weed wise included, you know, animals and weeds. Probably in our yards, we tolerate more than most do. Your um, aesthetic threshold is very high. It is. It's very high. Not, you know, not for the restaurant, but for outdoors, very high. Um, dollar weed, though, is one. It's not my favorite weed because it does show up and it, it really is different in a plant bed, in, in a lawn. You really notice it. It's very, grows very well in those environments. But this is a native aquatic weed and it loves water. That's the key point, it loves water. So if we are irrigating um, and we continue to irrigate just kind of on a schedule every two to three days, whether it's the plant bed or the lawn, we're really not gonna have any success managing dollar weed. We're gonna encourage it. Um, so grow it as a ground cover, let it be your lawn in that case. Uh, and just mow it and you have a nice green, very bright, shiny uh, plant bed, ground cover, or lawn. Um, if you want to manage dollar weed, you have to start with good irrigation practices. Um, using that mulch is good, but cutting back on the water on those established landscape plants, uh, making sure your lawn is only getting water when it indicates it needs it. And that takes practice. Uh, so you're not, you're not watering on a schedule. So combine that, you will use some herbicides as well to manage dollar weed. And this is where you really need to get some professional help. Some of the homeowner products have a little bit of, of work against dollar weed. They're not going to be great because there's all that underground system. Um, you know, we used to have atrazine. Uh, the concentration in the products is much lower than it used to be. Plus, atrazine has some issues, uh, can move off site into groundwater. So, we want to be cautious with that. Uh, so think about a professional, uh, consider certainty. It's shown really good success in some studies uh, with one application in addition to that reduced water uh, input and then also Celsius. So these are products our professionals will have that you can apply, I mean, that they can apply to help work together in a really integrated approach to start managing that dollar weed. Will you ever get rid of it all? Likely not. What you may come back and do is need to spot treat here and there. Um, in the plant bed, you know, you may have to dig a little out uh, in addition. 
but you know, you can kind of get it where it's a little more manageable, but try to think you're not really going to go for total eradication. Perfect. So not ever going to eradicate it, but you can manage it. I like that. Uh, you don't always have uh, uh, satisfactory answers to this problems, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the best we can hope for with dollar weed. You know, my parents have a little, a little wooded area behind their house and there's, before you get to it, it's, it's very marshy and it's almost 100% dollar weed. <laughs> so that kind of gives you an idea of, of where dollar weed wants to be like that said. So Chris, we're going to get into kind of some specific weeds here for the next couple of minutes to tar that, that people deal with. This is one we don't often deal with in the landscape, but it's more of an agricultural weed we think of, but this person has an issue with it. Um, how to get rid of Johnson grass weed. Got any insights on that? So uh, I, it's not going to be that common in the landscape. It can definitely be in the landscape. Uh, Brent, and most of the information that you find on it is going to be focused on um, uh, managing uh, Johnson grass in pastures or in agricultural type settings. I did post um, one article that we have that just um, talks about how to identify uh, Johnson grass and then also some management, but it's pasture specific. Um, if it's in turf grass, you're not going to really have too many options to selectively control it into another grass um, uh, uh, post-emergence. Um, if it's in landscape beds, so there are several different herbicides that can be used, and those would be our germinicides. So that would be things with active ingredients like um, uh, fluazoprop, phenaxoprop, uh, 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 cl clifidem, uh, cethoxidem, et cetera. So uh, fusillade, you might see something called fusillator. You might just see it that's sold as a grass killer. But basically you would wanna look for those active ingredients and those are gonna only control grasses. And so they could be used around landscape plants uh, to control um, uh, grasses in beds and things like that. So non-selective herbicides can work also, uh, but it is a very difficult grass to control. So it's something that's gonna probably take multiple applications. Very good, Uni a unique weed problem. And uh, I just wanted to mention our Tennessee listener on Facebook has been dethroned. We have a listener uh, joining us from Pakistan on Facebook. So we have gone international. So we appreciate you joining us from Pakistan. Shout out. Everyone's got weed problems, yo. Everybody's got weed problems. It does not matter where you are. So we appreciate everybody joining us regardless of where you're from. Um, Chris, go, in, go into another uh, really problematic weed this, this Zoom listener says, I've been trying to get rid of oxalis species in my yard for several years with little luck, mostly by digging it up. So do you have any tips for this listener on in a lawn area or in a landscape, how to get rid of that oxalis? Yeah, so oxalis is going to be, it's going to be a perennial weed and it's going to sp be spreading from, um, uh, from seed uh, as well as spreading vegetatively. And so you've got a couple different things working against you there. One thing that is very effective on oxalis is, is it is very, one, from seed, it is very sensitive to pre-emergence herbicides. Just about every pre-emergence herbicide that we'll test will get at least 9% control of, of oxalis with, uh, so pre-emergence herbicides can be a good option uh, regardless. Uh, and beds, mulch can also work. Uh, if it's in turf grass, you're gonna want uh, basically um, uh, some, um, uh, any kind of uh, broadleaf herbicide is generally going to work in those. In landscape beds, you have things like, of course, glyphosate, and then you have um, uh, some of those, uh, those other non-selective herbicides that I talked about. Uh, it really just depend upon the, um, the situation, but it is a difficult weed to control because it does spread uh, in the two different ways. And so it is something that just, uh, it's going to take some diligence and some time, but I would recommend probably incorporating some pre-emergence herbicides into um, uh, the method. Hand weeding can work, but it is very difficult because it breaks apart. And if you leave any, just a little piece of um, stem fragment behind, that's going to re-root and grow. Yeah, I was, actually, I was gonna okay, ask- Okay, go, go for it, Mark, real quick. Uh, I was gonna ask Beth if she lets that one go too, because so do I, and you can eat uh, oxalis as well. So the next time you're out there pulling it, you know, take a little bite of the flower. It's related to star fruit and it's got a very nice little tropical flair to the taste there. I hadn't quite got as hungry as y'all have over there in Tallahassee. <laughs> I eaten but, I, but they are edible. Yeah, I was gonna just a personal anecdote on oxalis. I planted the, uh, the purple leaved one in a pot um, and three or four years later now, it is naturalized throughout my landscape. So if you bring it in, in one of those selections, it will reseed and you can it can be a problem, so. 
Um, Beth, moving on to another weed, yet another weed that we have lots of issues with, particularly in turf grass. How would you recommend a controlled dove weed in a zoysia grass lawn, or probably our most popular newer turf grass? Yeah, more and more landscapers are installing uh, zoysia grass and homeowners are, are looking to these new zoysia grasses for an attractive lawn. And the plus with zoysia is they're very tolerant of a lot of herbicides uh, and the thick growth can keep out a lot of weeds. That's an advantage for zoysia. Uh, but occasionally you'll have a problem. And remember, dove weed is going to be like dollar weed. It is a moisture loving weed. Uh, the downside in St. Augustine is that dove weed looks really similar to St. Augustine and people don't know they have a problem until it flowers late in the summer. Um, it's a beautiful purple little flower if you've got it established. Um, but then after a frost, it immediately turns yellow, looks terrible. Uh, and you find out that's all you have in your yard. But in zoysia, what you can do with doveweed, you really want to try to tackle this one pre-emergently. Um, a lot of the homeowner products may not work quite as well, but if you can get some commercial products, um, either that the homeowner can buy or a commercial applicator, something like Tower or Spectacle G, those are also has some labels for ornamental beds as well if you've got a problem established in an ornamental bed that you can't hand pull, uh, you can help work on some pre-emergent for that dove weed. Remember, like Dr. Marble said, this is not emerging when crabgrass is uh, early. It's a later, so where the soil is warm, about 65, 70 degrees. So we tend to look, depending on the year, about the 1st of May uh, for some of these weeds to start emerging. And again, like he said, by the time you're early pre-emergent, it's gone uh, by the time this one emerges. So a second application may be needed. Um, there are some post-emergents that uh, commercial applicators can kind of tackle, but it's a little bit harder with some selective products. So pre-emergent is the best, but really manage that irrigation. Look at your system, make sure it needs that water. Zoysia grass is really tough. You don't want it to go brown in relation to drought stress, but it sure can take uh, quite a bit of time before you need to water again. So every two to three days may be way too much for zoysia. For sure. I have, I have a PTSD with doveweed. I helped my dad after Hurricane Michael reseed a, a little area of his lawn with centipede grass and apparently it was old seed and about two weeks later he called and said man it's coming up great come take a look at it and I went look and you can see where this is going it was a beautiful carpet of doveweed and I said I'm not sure this centipede but anyway well, if you drive by it fast enough on the road no one knows it's doveweed <laughs> yeah. for his lawn so. if it if it live it would if it were a perennial it'd be gorgeous you know yeah, it's yeah. lush and green but grass. no it's gone in the winter for sure thanks Beth Larry, this is a question that we get a lot this time of the year. You know, we've got this dormant turf grass and yet we see all these green things popping up everywhere and it just makes our yard look kind of unkempt. So can we control winter weeds in dormant turf grass? Should we? So what are your thoughts on that? Yes, you can. Uh, in some cases, there are some weeds that we don't have good options for. So, you know, okay. a good starting point is to know specifically what weed, weeds you're targeting. Consult that, the book. That's really helpful. To know and, and and your extension office master gardeners your you know the extension agents can help you uh, identify the weeds that that are most problematic but yes you can control them in the winter and there are actually some um sometimes there's more options in the winter months as far as herbicides are concerned because the That's grass true. is not actively growing this year and again i'm in crestview it's cold it's first year I've seen in a long time, our lawns look like northern lawns. I mean, they, yeah. the, the, the zoysia grass lawns, the centipede grass lawns are just tan brown. Yeah. And for some reason, the winter annual weeds, and by the way, the majority of weeds that we have in our, in our lawns during the winter months, most of them happen to be winter annual weeds. Sure. But they, they apparently were hit by some of this cold weather that came in. Uh, it, there was a delay. I'm not seeing, I'm just now seeing some of the winter weeds really, you know, coming up. Yeah. Going back to what I said earlier, um, if, if you can control the weeds when they're young, they're, they're easier to control with the herbicide. Yep. Uh, you're getting them before they produce, reproduce themselves. And um, if, if you look at a selective herbicide, you're, you're, you know, looking at weeds that are growing up and growing now, a selective herbicide that is labeled 
for the particular lawn grass that you have, you absolutely can control a lot of these winter weeds right now. A better option would have been to come in in October uh, based on the temperature as well and put a pre-emergent out. Um, there may be posted to the chat box, I don't know. There's two little fact sheets that I put together that Beth helped me out in being able to post these. So uh, hopefully you, you can get these. One is called Summer Annual Lawn Weed Control Timeline. And the other one is just simply Winter Annual Lawn Weed Control Timeline. The final thing on that, I, on the back, I'm looking at it right now. On the front, it gives you a, a timeline on when to control. And you got this narrow window for the winter weeds of basically the month of October. But when you fine tune this, it says in October when nighttime temperatures drop to 55 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit for several consecutive nights, that's when you, you need to be out there, just a little narrow window to get it right with these pre-emergent herbicides. Yeah, it's pretty specific. Yeah, check out that fact sheet. I really like that. I looked at that before we got started here. Chris, another unusual weed that, you know, we don't see often, but, or as often, but it can certainly be an issue. Is there a way to manage dandelions in the, in the garden? They've taken over. Um, yeah, and again, it's going to be kind of like the same recommendations that I was saying for oxalis in terms of specific herbicides. It can be fairly difficult to manage, but those pre-emergents are uh, good on it. Things with us, oxybin as an active ingredient or um, one of those group three herbicides like prodiamine or something. I did post a, um, I think I just did that this morning, actually. I posted, um, UC Davis has a really good fact sheet on um, dandelion management, and they have information for um, uh, lawns and then also in, in planting beds. Some of the lawns don't really apply to um, uh, Florida, but this question was about in the garden um, anyways. But um, so like if you were wanting to do the, uh, go the uh, org organic route, so I mean, mulch is gonna be effective on it because those seeds are very small. Uh, they require light in order to germinate. So that's uh, mulch is effective. Uh, and then the pre-emergence herbicides. And then also those, um, like those glyphosate alternatives, I list a bunch of um, non-selective uh, burn down herbicides, uh, uh, organic herbicides that can be used. And those will, uh, the dandelion will be able to come back from its tap root, but after a couple of applications, you should be able to get it under control. Awesome. That's a tough one. Mark, another tough one, and lots of people have this problem all over the Panhandle, fat all over the Southeast. Um, what's the best way to handle our good friend, the torpedo grass, this invasive plant in lawns and flower beds? Uh, well, I will say sorry. If you have it in your lawn, I'm so sorry. Uh, you know, so I, the link we put in here is the, is the link from the UF IFAS Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants. Now, torpedo grass is definitely a weed, right? This is on the invasive plant list. It is a known invader of natural habitats. And unfortunately, now it is being found in people's, you know, in sod, actually. I think it's been coming in in folks' sod. So, uh, you know, what they found is, you know, glyphosate, uh, the active ingredient Roundup is the kind of the, you know, the way to go for controlling torpedo grass. Unfortunately, if you have it mixed in with your landscape beds or your lawn, that's also going to kill your your other plants. So, uh, again, I'm sorry. My my neighbor actually has it, and he has the method of he basically paints. He goes through and he takes some glyphosate, and he will paint the torpedo grass stems that are mixed in with the lawn. Uh, that that will work uh, if it takes over. That's one where, like Dr. Marvel said, you may need to just start from scratch, you know, like spray the whole thing. It's going to take a long time, but spray it all down. It, the, the thing is, it's a good chance it's going to come back too. So it's, it's a real problem. Now, if you have it, or torpedo grass is also like an aquatic plant invader. So it's really bad around aquatic systems. So that is where you want to be careful on looking at your specific product that you're using to make sure it is allowed to be used in aquatic type settings. So um, there are some formulations of glyphosate that can be used near the water. So you'd want to be, use one of those products. But I'm sorry, gotcha. it's not, that's not an easy one. Chris, are there any specific situations that there, you know, are some things that we can do other than you know starting over? Or yeah, so uh, just like Mark said, glyphosate is going to be by far the most effective option. Uh, right. You do have a couple of graminicides that are going to have activity on it. 
Um, so those grass specific herbicides, um, uh, they're commercially available. So one is segment, uh, the active ingredient in that is cethoxidem. That's available to homeowners and certain grass killers. And then the other one is Fusilade 2 with the active ingredient fluazifop. And then that's another graminicide that's available uh, in some uh, um, homeowner products as a, a grass killer, or at least I've seen it. So um, uh, with uh, also the Fusilade, so the Fusilade 2, it's labeled for use in zoysia, um, turf grass and centipede grass. Um, but with those graminicides and even with glyphosate, even if you're going at high rates, be prepared to be in a, a fight, uh, essentially, because it's going to be something that's going to be a long process. It's not something that you're going to go out and treat even two times and probably get control of. I say one thing that you can do, uh, if it is very bad, like in the turf grass, for instance, is to keep the property mowed uh, uh, fairly short and then sell the property before anyone has knows that the torpedo grass is there. So that's another uh, option. <laughs> would, would asphalt work for that one, Dr. Marvin? <laughs> asphalt, asphalt can be effective. So <laughs> it's like cogan grass. There's a field out by the center that has cogan grass and um, uh, they put a apartment complex on top of it. Uh, and that, that's effective for cogan grass and <laughs> torpedo grass, but that's about, the, uh, most, that's about the only thing. Well, yeah, so those are, I mean, torpedo grass, if I had to rank the, uh, you know, our, our common lawn landscape weeds, that's number one for me. It's just, it's an, it's an awful, awful weed. So we're right at one hour. We've got a couple more questions to go, but if you need to leave us today, we appreciate it. And thank you for joining. Um, and please uh, check out our calendar and join us for our subsequent sessions every month of the year uh, through 2021. But we'll finish up with just a couple of questions here. Um, Beth, I like this question. Uh, this is from a listener in the Western Panhandle of Florida. How will Hurricane Sally or how do hurricanes in general impact weed populations the next year? So remember, we've talked about, you know, weeds are not really, they're, they're symptomatic. They're not the cause. Weeds are also going to fill a void. And whenever we have a hurricane come through, we have lots of voids that are created. Trees go over, soil is disturbed, it's upturned, you have equipment coming in. And underneath all this soil is a seed bank. It's just waiting for the right conditions and sunlight and moisture to go to town. So we actually will introduce weeds sometimes we haven't seen before. We sometimes think they blow in with the hurricane when they may have actually just been in the soil all along waiting. Um, so you are likely in those disturbed areas to see more weeds. An interesting thing, whenever you look through the wildflower book, a lot of the site says disturbed areas uh, that a lot of these wildflowers like to grow. And so we're going to have more. Uh, you're just going to have to work on some of those practices as you get your beds reestablished, good mulching get a good lawn established uh, when you start redoing that landscape. But don't, don't be too overwhelmed. Remember there's, look up, uh, enjoy what's, what else is in that landscape that's starting to come back and regrow uh, after a hurricane recovery. But just realize we're all gonna have more weeds after that situation. I love that answer. Uh, and just for those of you who are still with us, just wanted to say, we again, we appreciate you being here. Check out the chat. We've got a survey link. If you would, take a minute or two. Won't take much longer than that. Go through, fill out our survey for us. We greatly appreciate it. And our full 2021 schedule is down there. We're going to do one or two more here before we get out, to, get out of here today. Larry, I love this question. Um, what are some of the best weed maintenance tools? So what should, what are some of the tools that every gardener should have in their in their garden shed for weed management? I'm gonna start in, in the lawn. The, the lawn is a, a good mower to keep your, your the mower blade sharp, mow on a regular basis and mow at the correct height uh, for your lawn species. And the garden, uh, the, there's a tool that I've used that's called, I think the, the, the term I've seen is scuffle. Some people call it shuffle hoe, but a scuffle hoe, it looks like they're made differently, but it, you can get online and look up scuffle, S-C-U-F-F-E-L, scuffle hoe. It's different from a traditional hoe. It, um, you pull it just below the surface. You can go back and forth with it, forward or backwards, and um, you can move through a, a, a sizable, actually, vegetable garden or flower bed, plant bed pretty quickly with it. Again, trying to get those weeds when they're young. You know, you're disrupting the root system, you're severing, cutting through the stems. So a shuffle hoe 
Uh, what Dr. Marble said earlier, I can't go, uh, agree with more. Uh, I, I probably in my own landscape uh, could go broke trying to buy enough mulch. And I use, I recycle things on site, <clears throat> but maintaining a two to three inch layer of appropriate mulch. And again, I like the organic mulch, pine straw, uh, wood chips, whatever you, you know, prefer. It can be a mixture of some of those things, but a two to three inch layer of mulch maintained over the soil surface can do such a great job as a tool to prevent weeds. Um, good water management, either, you know, if you water too much, if you let it get too dry, uh, it's gonna favor certain weed species. So a, a good watering system as a tool and using it correctly, uh, those are some that come to mind. A good, you, a good uh, lawnmower used correctly, a, shuff, a scuffle hoe, a mulch, and, and watering correctly, having a system where you can water uh, whatever it is, a, a lawn, uh, a landscape beds or a garden correctly. And start to a to a weed management toolbox. Um, we I'm going to do two more questions. I do want to shout out our family and consumer science agents here in the district are offering a virtual cooking class. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, head down to the chat bottom right and take a look at that. Chris, we had some discussion in Facebook over on Facebook a little while ago about using homemade products for weed control. Could you just provide us a little bit of guidance on homeowners that are thinking about using stuff that's not necessarily labeled for, for weed control? Yeah, I don't recommend it. There's a lot of concoctions that are online. I mean, people can do it. You're not going to cause a whole lot of damage by going out and spraying vinegar, but you're not also probably not going to see the best results either, or at least uh, it's going to cost a lot of money. And then like the stuff like, I mean, I've seen some crazy stuff where people will be uh, talking about they want an alternative to glyphosate, and so they go and pour Clorox, you know, over a, a bunch of uh, weeds and stuff, like, and it's just insane. Uh, but there are some, uh, I mean, there, what, what I tell people to do is, you, if you want to choose these alternatives to the synthetic pesticides, look at these organic products, like a lot of the ones that, um, that I mentioned in that uh, publication. So there's a lot of ones that are derived from plant oils. Uh, there's vinegar-based uh, products, but essentially what the benefit is of using those as opposed to making something up, uh, you know, online. Uh, one, you can call, I've seen people cause a lot of damage with salt, for example, um, uh, when they do the salt and the soap and stuff like that. But two, those products are mixed and there's at least some research behind those. So they're at a, they're at a correct rate and they tell you how to mix them at a, a proper ratio to get weed control. And it also has a label and directions to follow and it tells you the proper protection that you need. So even vinegar that you cook with and stuff, you know, if you get that in your eyes when you're out there spraying it and things, that can be uh, fairly dangerous. And so those vinegar-based acidic acid products, they're going to have, they're going to give you the recommendations in terms of the safety precautions and stuff that you need to take. And they're really not um, all that uh, expensive either. Um, uh, and they're much easier to use and apply. Words of wisdom right there. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and I just want to close out here with a question. I'm going to ask Beth. Uh, I like Beth. Beth and Mark share a similar perspective. I like it. Beth, what? Just a final final thoughts on weeds and weed control to leave us with today. You know, weeds are going to be everywhere. We all are going to have them in the landscape and turf. Don't be overwhelmed. Uh, you can get easily frustrated with gardening uh, by weeds. Uh, realize that just some of those good practices. Uh, can help you reduce some of those, but always make sure you're getting the best information from your research universities. I know there's a lot of forums out there. There's a lot of chit chat back and forth, uh, but like Dr. Marvel just said, you know, some of that information is maybe not the best and maybe not safe. Um, so go to your research universities. Uh, we're happy to help. We, we encounter the same problems you do, uh, and, you know, sometimes you just don't worry so much. We'll, we'll help you the best we can have a, an attractive and healthy landscape. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much, Beth. So we're going to end there today. Many thanks to all of you for joining us. Thank you to our panelists, our behind the scenes folks. Again, Julie McConnell, Mary Salinas, Matt Lawler, um, and to our panelists, Dr. Chris Marble. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And uh, Mr. Larry Williams, Ms. Beth Bowles, Mr. Mark Tansig, we thank you guys for being here. And on behalf of all of the rest of us involved with our Northwest District Horticulture team, thank you for being here today and we look forward to seeing you 
in March and throughout the rest of 2021. We hope you enjoy it. Check out our survey and we'll see you right here next time. Have a good afternoon.